four. And uh, hopefully, if I don't digress too badly, we'll, we'll make some headway today. Because at this rate, we're going to have to be 150 years old to get through the Bible. But before I go there, I'm just going to draw our attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You don't need to turn there. But uh, this is what Paul said just after writing about the Exodus and some of the things that happened in the Exodus. Paul said this, 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 11, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And Paul said uh, that these things that were written in the Old Testament, the, and in particular these first five books, this is not just archaic history that doesn't matter anymore. Paul said you're supposed to pay attention to these things. There's instruction for us there. There's a testimony to Jesus there. And there's examples for us to follow and not to follow. It's important. It's important that we read these things. And so uh, we've launched off onto this very ambitious project of surveying the entire Bible together. I have no idea how long it will take. But here we are in Exodus, the fourth chapter. And remember what's happened here. The, the Israelites are in bitter bondage in Egypt. And God has called and commissioned this man, Moses, now 80 years old, to lead the people out. And God is in control. God's going to lead the people out with supernatural power. And so we want to read about this. Now let's take a look at chapter 4, Exodus 4 and verse 30. And Aaron, that's Moses and Aaron, his brother, and Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their affliction, when they bowed their head, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. So the idea is when they found out that God really was interested in them and that he had a plan for them and that he had not abandoned them, it says they bowed their heads and they worshipped. And, and this is kind of like the, a New Testament reality that we like to reflect on. John tells us that we love him, Jesus. Why? Because he first loved us. See, God made himself maximally lovely. And we are to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Not for no reason, but because he tasted death for, for every man. He paid our sin debt on that cross. He condescended and took a human nature. Jesus did. Left the high courts of heaven and condescended added a human nature to his own divine nature, one person with two natures forever, and that divine person experienced death for us because he loves us. And so because of that, we love him. He loved us first. And we see a little hint of this here. The people bowed their heads in worship. Now, people are fickle too, aren't they? It's a sad fact in the scriptures. We sometimes read that so-and-so believed, and then we realize later on it was a very just superficial uh, kind of belief. And when hard times came, they, they just, just as quickly abandoned that belief. We see that kind of thing, too, in the scriptures. and We see that when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. There were crowds of people crying out, Hosanna to the son of David in the highest. Save now. This is the king of Israel. And then just a few short days later, there they are crying out, crucify him. And we're going to see that kind of thing in the book of Exodus uh, as well. But uh, let's look here at chapter 5. We'll read the first five verses, and let's think about what's here. Chapter 5, verse 1. And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And they said, The Lord, uh, the God of the Hebrews, hath met with us, and... Uh, let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with a sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get you to your burdens? And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many. You make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day that the taskmasters of the people uh, of the officers saying, and then he's going to go on and give them instructions now. He's going to make their burdens even worse, is what happens here uh, in the narrative. So here we read that Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh. They're making all kinds of demands. You let the people go. They need to sacrifice to God out there in the desert. 
and Pharaoh says, uh, I won't do it. Now look at his response there. Look at verse 2. Major, major theme, and we need to talk about this. Verse 2, Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? That is an absolutely essential, major topic in the Bible. It, you're going to trace this topic throughout the entire 66 books of the Bible. Who is God? I heard a once a very wise Bible teacher say, there's only, there's only really three messages you could ever preach out of the Bible. God's person, God's plan, and God's people. Everything else that you read from the Bible, if it's of any value at all, it's going to be linked to one of those things. And in fact, those three things kind of form a unit, don't they? God's people are God's people because of who he is. You can't escape this. We need to talk about, I'm sorry to use the word, theology. Theology proper. There is no more important topic that, that could cross your mind, that you could take time thinking about. Theology. Theology proper, the doctrine of God. Who's God? Who is this person? Could you flip ahead in your Bibles to Jeremiah, the ninth chapter? If you like, you could turn there if you like. If you don't want to, that's okay. But Jeremiah chapter 9, very, very key passage. Even the great apostle Paul will quote from this very verse passage that we're going to look at here. But Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 23 this is one of my favorite verse passages. Two verses here. Listen to this. Here's Jeremiah the prophet. Thus says the Lord, Jeremiah 9, 23, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. That's God that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Forget your riches, forget your power, forget your wisdom. I know in North America, if you don't have those three, you don't have much, right? I mean, I can't rejoice in my riches. What else is there? <laughs> God says, no, no, no. You, if you want to glory, glory in this, that you know me. And that puts everything else into the shadows. Whatever else we might know, no matter how brilliant we may think ourselves as philosophers or scientists or, or historians or communicators or salesmen or whatever, name it all, it pales. It goes into the shadows compared to the knowledge of God. And we're shocked. This great God that inhabits eternity, the king of eternity, of all the things he wants to tell us about himself, he says, know this, that I am the Lord which exercises loving kindness. First, you need to know that I'm a loving God. I'm omnibenevolent. And I'm just. And in these things, I delight. Hey, you want to be a delight to God? You want to make Heavenly Father smile? Exercise these things. Do good in the, do good in the world. Be honest. Love people. Show loving kindness, long-suffering, those kinds of things. God says he delights in those things. Paul had a prayer for the Colossians. In Colossians uh, chapter 1 and verse 10, Paul says that you may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being faithful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That, was God. that was Paul's prayer for the Colossians, that you should increase in the knowledge of God. Remember in context, we're talking about that Pharaoh that didn't know the Lord and didn't want to. And God says, trust me, of all the things you can learn in this world, learn, learn who God is. Learn who he is, and then get to know him personally. You just go back here. Go to, go to um, First Chronicles. I know this is a little bit of flipping here, but I want you to see First Chronicles chapter 28. You can turn there. You just go back a couple books from Jeremiah, but First Chronicles 28. And here we have David, King David, the greatest king in Israel's monarchy. Uh, he's addressing his son that's about to take over for him, Solomon. And uh, David has things he wants to tell Solomon before he dies, before David dies. And he's not going to just shoot the breeze about the weather. When, when life is coming to its end, you want to communicate that which is essential, that which is valuable to you in your heart, that you, that you really want the next generation to know. You don't just waste your words. We kind of saw that, didn't we, with Jacob addressing his 12 sons. Well, you see it here in 1 Chronicles 28 and verse 9. Now listen to David, okay? And this is words for us too. 
First Chronicles 28.9, And now, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father. Know him, Solomon. Know this God. And serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Hey, that's not very comforting, is it? There is a, there is a, you know, a promise in the scriptures that if you draw nigh unto God, he will draw nigh unto you. If you seek him, you will find him. If you call upon his name, he'll save you. God loves you. We just read it. Jeremiah told us he's a God of loving kindness. He's not a monster. He loves you. He's not willing that any should perish. You remember Ezekiel tells us that God is not uh, taking pleasure in the death of the wicked that dies? No. And yet David's words to his son Solomon are uh, very clear, and they echo a New Testament reality, and that is, friends, there comes a time when a person has irrevocably rejected God, and God says, that's it, you've had your last chance, I now give you over to a reprobate mind. A mind void of judgment, you will not make a right judgment anymore, you know, and, and you're gone from me now. I will not shed any more light into your life. It will only add to your condemnation. And that's, that's a tragic thought, isn't it? And, but we have, to, we have to accept that the judge of all the earth does right. And when he says a person is to be judicially hardened for their willing unbelief, then that is the time when they are to be judicially hardened. We say, Lord, yes. And we don't know as much as you, and our hearts are not as righteous as yours, but we know that God loves people. And we know that God doesn't want people in hell, and he doesn't want to condemn people. But nevertheless, people have been given this thing called self-determination, and they make their choices. That makes sense to us, doesn't it? And so I, I always felt that if we're reading the Bible aright, we should have very strong emotions. We should be reacting to what we read here. It's not same old, same. We don't read it, put it on the shelf, forget about it. I always believe that as you read it, you should be... You should be horrified at your own sin, and you should feel the fear of the Lord. And yet you should, be thank, you should be like this. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God he loves us, and he doesn't want us condemned. You know, If the righteous scarcely be saved, Peter says, where shall the ungodly and the sinner stand? I always felt that, that we should be reacting to some of this. So the Bible says we should know this God. We shouldn't be like Pharaoh who says, I don't know him and don't want to. And friends, the only way to know him is to open up the Bible and learn about him. That's how he has set it up. He gave us his word. So this is essential that you come to know me, says God, and here's my word to help you do it. Now I understand that God, yes, he's revealed in the creation. In the created order, we see his wisdom and power. Yes, we do. And God has revealed his wise laws to us in our heart of hearts, in our consciences. That's true. But creation and conscience, as clearly as they reveal God to us, they do not give us a saving knowledge of God. We, we, you see, the Bible's very clear. You need to believe in the Lord Jesus. You need to call upon the name of the Lord if you want to be saved. And the way I understand the scriptures, it seems to me that if we have some, some person living off in some world that's, let's say, some dark jungle someplace where the gospel hasn't penetrated, as I understand the Bible, if a man will cry out to the living God that has confronted him in creation and conscience... In, in sincerity, he will do that. God will make sure that man gets the gospel to respond affirmatively to. That's how I read the scriptures. Uh, but the sad fact is, most don't respond affirmatively to creation and conscience. Most deny and suppress the truth by means of unrighteousness, as Paul tells us in Romans 1. But the fact is, we're going to have to get the gospel if we want to be saved. And friends, the Bible contains truths, I think I've said it before, that you just couldn't have any other way. You, you wouldn't know certain things about God. You couldn't come to a saving knowledge of God if you didn't have the scriptures. If all we had, if all we had was unaided human reason, you wouldn't come to a right conception of who God was. And you can just trace the history of philosophy. And I attempt to do that. And you can read uh, the writings of Plato. Who's, heard, who's ever heard of Plato, one of the most brilliant men to walk the earth? Plato was a very, very brilliant man. And uh, he attempted to describe what the ultimate reality would be, what this, 
this being we call God would be like. And he said, well, this God would be perfect, so this God would be unchanging. And that would, that would mean any uh, dialogue with humankind would be impossible, and an earthly visitation would be impossible. Well, of course, we know the scriptures flatly deny that. God has visited his people. Uh, Plato said that uh, God was completely self-sufficient, and therefore uh, he didn't love. He, he thought love was a kind of imperfection, so this God wouldn't love. You see, this is, where, this is where brilliant philosophy takes you, unaided human reason, without the light of God's word. It leads you into total error. He said, uh, because God was unchanging and perfect, he wouldn't know love, joy, or sorrow. And of course, the scriptures say that's, that's flat wrong. Uh, God pleads with his people to repent. He doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked that dies. It says it repented God at his heart that he made man. He didn't want to destroy man in the flood. He doesn't want to condemn people to eternal conscious torment. And so, brilliant philosophers, unaided, uh, without the light of the gospel, they come to a wrong conception of who God is. We need God to tell us who he is and what he wants from us, and what he expects, what his moral demands are. We need the Bible, friends. We need it. It's essential. By the way, if I could just mention this, uh, humankind doesn't come up with anything new. See, when Plato's sitting there trying to figure out who God is, uh, he's using his imagination, and he's coming up with... Uh, some ideas there. He's not coming to a right conclusion, but in many ways he's not coming up with anything new. Uh, and, and mankind never comes up with anything new. Yeah, I know. Who likes, anyone watch science fiction? You watch TV? You watch movies? Am I the only one here? I feel a little embarrassed. I like Star Trek. <laughs> you watch Star Wars or, or something like that, and you see all kinds of crazy looking vehicles, and you see crazy alien creatures, and you say, well, that thing looks pretty new. I never saw a guy with eyes on the sides of his head before, or whatever. Just Well, you know, friends, they look new to us, but they're not really. We know what eyes are, and we know what mouths are, and we know what machines are, we know what colors are, and, and friends, when we go to the movies and we look at something that appears new to us, it's just a weird combination of things that we are already familiar with. That's all man can do, you know. He takes the things that God has put into the world, and he jumbles them up and scrambles them up, and he makes all kinds of neat combinations, but he doesn't come up come up with anything really new. I mean, Leisha, where's Leisha? She's busy drawing pictures over there, listening, I'm sure. But she's our, <laughs> she's our resident artist. Leisha, how many primary colors we got? Three primary colors. And uh, how many colors can you make by mixing those things up in weird combinations? Do you know? Countless, countless. Can we make, can we imagine a new primary color? No. We take what God's given us and we jumble them up and we make all kinds of things that aren't really new. And this is an interesting dilemma that the, that the atheist world needs to address. Where did the idea of God come from? If the only thing we can do is scramble things that actually exist and make neat combinations with them, where did we get the idea of God? See, God is eternal from everlasting to everlasting. He's eternal and infinite. But where in our experience have we ever been confronted with something that's universal, eternal, and infinite? Nowhere. The, the, infinite, the infinite is nowhere in reality. You've never been confronted with an infinite set of anything. And yet you've got it in your head that God is infinite. Well, we would say that God has put that there because he actually exists. Our Bible says that our God is triune. He is one eternal being. From all eternity has existed. One eternal nature. Nevertheless, that one being is three persons. Our God is one, and yet he is tri-personal. Three persons there with their own individual identities and volitions. Now, where have you ever been confronted with a trinity before? Did mankind come up with this conception of God? I don't think so. And our God is love. Isn't that amazing? He's just. He's fierce. He's got wrath. He's in a constant state of hostility against sin and evil and unrighteousness, and yet he is love. Verse John 4 is very clear. God is love. And he demonstrates that love for us on the cross. Paul says it, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that he, while we were yet sinners, enemies in our minds, by wicked works against God, while we were in that state, he died for us. He experienced death to pay our sin debt on the cross. Our God became a man. The Lord Jesus came to the earth and he died on that cross. 
Acts 2.24 says, but death couldn't hold him. It was impossible that death could hold him. Peter says it. The pangs of death were loosed. The pangs of death, that's uh, like birth pangs, right? I think Amanda knows about this. Probably she knows about that. When the baby's coming, she's coming, right? And there's no stopping her. Ruby's coming, (laughs) no stopping Ruby, she's coming. And when Jesus died, he rose again on the third day, and and the language there in Acts 2 is is very much uh, speaking in terms of birth pangs. Baby's coming, can't stop it. Jesus is coming out of the ground, can't stop it. Can't stop him. Why did he do that? Hebrews 2, 4, 14 and 15 says that, you know, he, he tasted death for all men, for all people. He did that to release you from the bondage of the fear of death. He did that. And amongst other things, he paid your sin debt and mine too, but he also wanted to release you from the bondage of fear of death. He came back, he, he overcome uh, death, hell, and the grave. He overcame those things and he says, it's okay, don't be afraid. I made it good on the other side for you. That's why Paul tells us in Romans 8, we have not received the bondage of fear again, but the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. We don't fear death anymore. That's the God that we worship. That's the God that, that uh, asks us to know him. Glory in this, that you know me, understand me. That's, that's the God. And what a tragedy that we have men in the world who are just like Pharaoh of old, who says, I don't know this God, and I don't want to know this God. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? And that's the second thing I really want to talk about. Who is God? We have... Well, we have a lot of data in the scriptures. We looked at some of it. Some of those things that we've con- contemplated just now show us that God is maximally lovely. He is to be loved. In fact, the greatest commandment says you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Shouldn't be hard for us. He's demonstrated his own love for sinners on that cross. The cruel scourging and the mocking, he endured it all for us. But if you love him, says Jesus, you will obey me. He tells it very clearly, John 14, 21. He that hath my commandments, he it is that loveth me. And I will love him, my father will love him, I will manifest myself to him. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey what I tell you. And that is not so easy in especially the Western world, where we are continually bombarded with messages in every form of media that says, who's number one in this world? You are. You need to buy this. You need to acquire that. You're number one. You deserve this. And it's selfishness to the core, being promoted, and immorality, and darkness. And if you want to sell a product these days, just say that it's sinfully good. Right? You've got to try this new thing. It's sinfully delicious. We just tack the word sinful on it and watch the people come flock to it. It must be good. It must be enjoyable. It's sinful. You know what I'm talking about. And there was a time, friends, when you wouldn't want to attach the word sinful to anything you're trying to promote because uh, that would cast you in a bad light, wouldn't it? And now we're living in an age where, where evil is called good and good is called evil. And the whole thing is upside down, and we say, thank you, Lord, for your word that can help us make sense out of this world. And Jesus said, I want you to obey me. In Psalm 101, the psalmist says, I will set no wicked things before my eyes. I'm going to ask you, you know, put up your hands, but how many of us are willingly putting wicked things before our eyes? You don't even have to try in this culture. Wicked things are everywhere. But who, I mean, look to your own heart and your own conscience, and you're putting wicked things before your eyes. God says, I want a cheerful giver. Are you giving back to the work of the Lord? Your time, resources, prayers, money, whatever you, whatever you got. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, he he asks a question, and he expects a negative answer there. 1 Corinthians 4. What do you have that you didn't receive? And if you've received everything you have, why are you glorying as though you had not received it? As though you earned it, or you were born with it? right? Or you acquired this due to your own great brilliance. Paul says, whatever you have, God gave it, and God wants a cheerful giver. You're to give back to the work of the Lord. I speak to some of the, I don't see a real big problem here, but I don't know who's going to hear my voice. But Paul says women are to be adorned in modest apparel. In our culture, 
it's uh, almost to the point where young ladies are going to be looked at by their peers as oddballs, as aliens, as weirdos, if they don't show uh, all, every nook and cranny of their body. I mean, they have to show, make sure everyone sees your form, make sure we see as much skin as possible. That's the culture. Paul says, modest apparel. Men don't need any help out there being immoral or having bad thoughts come into their minds. Thank you. <laughs> right? What about your speech? I mean, we're asking, who is this God that I should obey him? That's the context. Remember Pharaoh? Who is this Yahweh that I should obey him? Who is God that you and I should obey him? And Paul tells the Ephesians, let no corrupt communication proceed from your mouths. How are we doing with our mouths? I work in machine shop. Through the week, my collar is definitely blue. And I get to hear all of it to the point I'm not, I don't even get the least bit offended anymore unless I hear the name of the Lord Jesus tossed around and then I am offended and say something. And the guys in my area know not to do it for the most part. But, but the, the foul language, how are we doing with that? Corrupt communication proceeding out of our mouths? How about Ephesians 4.32? Forgive one another just as God for Christ's sake forgave you. Friends, I said it before, I'll say it again. Nobody under this roof has offended anybody else under this roof in any way that's comparable to the way we have all offended God with our sin. Right? Isn't that true? God is the greatest conceivable being. Maximally lovely, maximally great, omnibenevolent, wholly just. The very locus and paradigm of moral perfection who showed us nothing but love, and yet we sinned against him, we strike back at his character that reflects, that is reflected in those laws that we transgressed. And God says, I will forgive you. I will send my son to die and pay your sin debt and take care of all those things, all those wicked acts that you've committed in your heart and mind, maybe in deed. I'll do that because I love you. Now go and forgive your brothers and sisters like that. Is that easy to do? Sometimes not. Do you love Jesus, though? He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. Remember that? Isn't Luke 17, where he says, I want you to forgive 70 times 7? Remember that? And the, the apostles said, well, that's hard. Increase our faith. And Jesus said, hey, when a servant comes in from the field, the master doesn't say, oh, good job. Fix yourself something and fix me something while you're at it. He says, hey, <laughs> Make me something to eat, right? I'm the boss here. And we say, yes, Lord, we do as you say. But our boss is quite different. I mean, you understand this is an analogy, right? Our God is not a capricious, he's not a capricious tyrant that throws out commands arbitrarily and just pushes us around uh, for no good reason. That's not our God. But he is in charge. He's the Lord. And when you come to him for salvation, he's your Lord and Savior. And we obey him. Here's a hard one. Love your enemies. Do good to those that persecute you. Uh, Jesus said that too. Hard to do. Very hard to do. But who is the Lord that I should obey him? That's our God. And he has hard commands sometimes. Strikes against our own sensibilities, doesn't it? I think if we ask him for help, he will help us, you know. He said that. He's there to help us with this. Let's quickly go back to the book of Exodus. Let's synopsize some of chapter 5 here, okay? I really, want to, I really want to get a good start at this here. Chapter 5, from verses 3 to 21, Moses goes to the Pharaoh. He went to the Pharaoh. We're told about the confrontation. And he says, God, Pharaoh, has commanded us to go three days into the desert to sacrifice to him and worship him. And the Pharaoh absolutely refused. And it got much, much worse. You see, this is also telling us something about God. You know that? It says, God says, in this fallen, horrible world that we live in, even if you do everything I tell you, you do it faithfully. You do it with the right conscience. There may come a time, because you did what I told you, you're going to suffer worldly hardship. Okay, our God is, is not a God that looks at us like a bunch of pets and he's going to keep us healthy and comfortable at all times. He says, I have a plan that's going to be worked out and, and you may suffer for doing what I told you. 
And that's what happens. And on top of it, Moses gets rebuked by his own fellow countrymen. It's not only Pharaoh opposing Moses, but it's his own brethren. How do you like that? And why is he being opposed? Because he's being faithful to God. Look at uh, chapter 5, verse 22. Chapter 5, verse 22. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated the people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak thy name, he hath done evil to this people. Neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. Why are you doing this, Lord? Where are you? You told me to do this. I did it. The people are against me. Pharaoh's against me. He has made the, the burdens on the Egyptians, or the uh, Egyptians' burdens on the Israelites much worse now. Now their tasks are even greater. The oppression's even worse because I obeyed you. Well, this is not supposed to be a shock, is it? Didn't God already tell Moses Pharaoh wasn't going to let them go? Moses is just conveniently forgetting what God has said. God already told him this is not going to go as smooth as you think. Be ready for it. And Christians, we've been warned too. Uh, there is... There is a real persecution against Christians going on in other countries right now. It's gone on throughout all history. Just read it. Any history book will talk about it. And it's coming this way. The Bible says so. And Paul says to the believers at Lystra, he said, we must through many persecutions and through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. He said that. Acts 14. In 1 Thessalonians 3.3, Paul said, if you're a Christian, you are appointed to affliction. A home in heaven, eternal bliss with the Lord, yes, but worldly affliction. You're appointed to that. And Paul told Timothy in his last epistle to him, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And we don't hear this from pulpits much, but we need to talk about it. We don't want to be blindsided. We want to have our eyes open. We don't want to be willingly ignorant to any realities that are out there. You can do everything God tells you to do and do it perfectly with a good conscience and you may suffer, you probably will suffer persecution for the kingdom of God's sake. You will. You will. I want to read from Philippians, the third chapter here because it kind of ties up some of our, our thoughts here this morning. Here's the great apostle Paul who suffered tremendously for the cause of Christ. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7 after giving his pedigree, after telling us about all the education he received and how, many, uh, how much respect he could have had. And, and uh, in fact, I mean, this man, Paul, was truly great. In the eyes of men, he was, he was wonderful. He was awesome under heaven, under the sun. But listen to this. Compare this with the knowledge of God. Philippians 3, 7, But what, but what things were gained to me, those I count lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. I don't care to know much else than Jesus. He told the Corinthians that too. I determined to know nothing among you save Christ and him crucified. The knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of what? All things. A lot of people think Paul was married, you know, and he suffered the loss of even his wife. He suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now that we don't want to hear. I want to know him, yes, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Really? Paul says, yeah. And we don't hear this much, friends. But the, the New Testament, the New Testament is super saturated with verses talking about the persecution that the believer is to expect and his attitude he's supposed to adopt as he goes through it. It's all over the place. That's why Miller College of the Bible has now a modular course that they offer called The Theology of Persecution with a, with a textbook. And I went through that textbook and I, and I, I, 
a shame that I didn't appreciate the call of God's people to endure persecution for the kingdom of God's sake. It's everywhere. And you see, friends, in this part of the world, we haven't endured much persecution. And so our institutions of higher learning, they kind of just skim over those passages and give them some kind of spiritual meaning. And because the Western world is the one that produces the theology textbooks, this is, these are great truths that get lost. And God's people are not appreciating them. We're not being confronted with them. And so here from this pulpit, I'm just going to confront us all with them. Moses is doing everything right, and he's suffering for it. You can do everything right, and in this world, you probably suffer for it. But at the beginning of our service, I read from Romans 8, didn't I? And our momentary light affliction, Paul says, is not worthy to be compared with the eternal weight of glory, with the glory which will be revealed in us. The Christian life isn't a picnic, is it? Man, it's a battlefield. And we're going to contend with a lot as we walk through this life. We have lots of dragons we need to slay, don't we? We feel the effects of sin in our own bodies. We contend with health problems. We contend with opposition from ungodly men, unjust laws, bad neighbors. <laughs> Name it all. Aren't you glad that our God and Savior said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I'll walk with you through the fire. I'll be with you like I was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'll be the fourth man in your life. I'll get you through it. Draw nigh unto God, dear church family, and he will draw nigh unto you. We'll feel his presence. He'll give you the peace that passes understanding. Well, there's much more to say, but I want to stop right there. And we'll pick it up right where we left off uh, next week. A quick prayer, friends. Father, in Jesus' precious name, we thank you for this morning that we could be here in freedom to open up the Bible. Thank you for the precious truths, Lord, that we were